great. Um, hi, everyone. It's so great to see you all here on the webinar. I think we're all very excited to talk to Charu, who is here. Um, so this is a joint event, um, which at the same time is going to be a conservation optimism webinar and a conservation careers pro chat, which is going to go out as a podcast on their website. Uh, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Sophia castello Tikal. I'm the Interim Director for Conservation Optimism. So we really focus on sharing positive stories about uh, what's going on in conservation. And I'll let Nick introduce himself. Yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you, Sophia. My name is Nick Nikaski from Conservation Careers. Um, if you don't know who we are, we are a careers advice service for conservationists to help them to have successful careers. And I'm super excited to be um, working with Conservation Optimism today and to be talking to Charu as well. So yeah, welcome along everyone. Yeah, I think we we really thought that we had a lot of overlap here in terms of being able to share um, a conversation with Charu and talk about um, his career and then also, you know, his his take on the world. So I will, with no further ado, introduce you to Dr. Charu Mishra. Um, who maybe he can give a little wave, um, but he's there with an amazing backdrop. Uh, he is the executive director of the International Snow Leopard Trust and the co-founder of India's Nature Conservation Foundation. He has spent 25 years working to increase protection for snow leopards across all 12 of their range countries with the vital support of local people. Um, he was the winner of a Whitley Gold Award in 2005, as well as in 2022, and he is a world expert on snow leopard conservation, as well as a pioneer of community-based conservation as an approach. Um, he really works to enable harmonious coexistence between people and wildlife. And in 2016, he published The Partners Principles, which focused on presence, aptness, respect, transparency, negotiation, empathy, responsiveness, and strategic support. Uh, this year, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, he launched the Ethical Conservation Alliance at the Whitley Fund for Nature's People for Planet Summit. So we'll be talking about all of that uh, and maybe we can just get into it and welcome Charu. Right, yeah, and welcome Charu. And just a heads up as well, it, for people that are listening and watching um, online, it's great to have you. We are gonna do a QA and a at the end. Um, so yeah, it's good to have you there. Um, we will be recording that Q&A as well, just so you know. Normally if on the podcast, we don't record it. Today we are going to, so just so you know, that's kind of coming down the road, but you will get your opportunity to ask your questions of Charu then. Charu, it's great having you on this chat. Thank you for joining. Um, it's nice talking to you just before we kind of hit record as well. And there aren't many people I speak to who have had like a mini documentary narrated by Sir David Attenborough about themselves. I was watching that going, oh gosh, like drop the mic. <laughs> that must have been quite the moment. Uh, but we're here to talk about your work, your career, um, some of the many things that you've achieved and what you've learned through that that others can can kind of follow on from. Um, and we thought we'd, we'd start by talking about your work with the International Snow Leopard Trust specifically. You are a world-renowned conservation expert on snow leopards, as you just heard from Sophia, and as we all know. Um, could you just give us a bit of a, a kind of 101 um, about the Snow Leopard Trust, the International Snow Leopard Trust. Why was it formed? What problems is it seeking to tackle? And what work is it doing? And if you can kind of sprinkle in some success stories, we'd love that as well, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Sophia. The tremendously kind introduction. And, and um, Nick, as I say, that uh, being narrated by Sir David Attenborough is like my ten or four or five minutes of fame. <laughs> I don't think it's uh, happening again, but I'm very, very, um, very, uh, feel very privileged that it did happen. Mm. Um, thank you for this opportunity. And yeah, let me start by telling a bit about the International Snow Leopard Trust and my work there. Um, the trust is a 42 year old uh, organization. It's the oldest and largest organization dedicated to um, conserving snow leopards and high mountain ecosystems of Asia. And um, it was uh, founded in Seattle in, in Washington states in the United States. And um, that's where our headquarters continue to be. Uh, the work of the International Snow Leopard Trust largely focuses on, uh, like I said, promoting snow leopard conservation in the high mountains of Asia. That's where snow leopards occur. Uh, we um, 
our approach is really focused on uh, you know trying to do uh, rigorous and good science and then following it it up with what we like to believe is uh, an ethical approach to conservation uh, in partnership with local and indigenous communities. Hmm. So our work actually involves, even today, our partner communities, there are about 160 or so partner communities spread across the mountains of Asia. And those communities are actually protecting snow leopards in prime habitat of about uh, 150,000 square kilometers, which um, is pretty uh, significant. So, and a significant part of our priorities is to both strengthen and expand our work with the local community partners. And with these local community, uh, when you work with local communities, it's like it's these partnerships are typically for life. Just like when you set up a protected area, you know, you, you can't just walk away, you have to continue to manage it. And it's a very similar um, approach with local and indigenous communities. When we uh, when we create conservation partnerships with them, they are for life. Some of our oldest uh, partnerships are like more than 25 years uh, old. Um, we are also in support of this kind of ethical conservation. We also engage closely with governments and in 2013, we were able to bring the governments of all the 12 uh, snow leopard range countries together to create um, uh, an intergovernmental alliance uh, represented by environment ministers of all the 12 snow leopard range countries. And that is something that we continue to support. We, uh, that alliance is run uh, by, through a headquarters, which is based in a uh, secretariat that's based in Bishkek in Central Asia. And the, there are the, uh, the idea and the whole, uh, the goal of the Alliance is to really strengthen conservation of snow leopards and high mountain ecosystems by promoting, you know, uh, welfare and leadership of local communities in snow leopard conservation. And the idea is to strengthen snow leopard conservation over a quarter of its entire global range of almost 2 million square kilometers. And we, um, yeah, so that's sort of uh, the kind of work that we do at the level of communities, at the level of research, and uh, at the level of governments. I think that pretty much largely captures the work of the Snow Leopard Trust. That's so boring. impressive. Yeah, you're just doing so much. And I think one of the things that's really remarkable about your work, you know, you were talking about partnership alliance just coming up several times, right? These, This way of building relationships and kind of gaining consensus across um, people who initially might have quite just different goals. So we'll come back uh, to talking about alliances a bit later on. But in the meantime, I actually just have a question, which is what is the coolest thing that you have ever seen at one of your field sites? Um, I'm guessing it might be a slow leopard, but maybe not. So yeah, could you just tell us a bit about what it's like to be working in these beautiful places in these communities? Um, yeah, tell us. Yeah, sure, Sophia. I mean, no surprises here. It was a snow leopard site, but you know, I'm one of the few people, I guess, uh, who around the world who can and have truthfully claimed that they've lost count of how many times they've actually seen snow leopards in the wild. Mm -hmm. But this one particular time, I think, um, is uh, very special for me, especially because I think because of the meaning it carried for me. And this was uh, a snow leopard that I watched for five hours together with my son, who's 14 now, Shivi, but he was eight then. Mm -hmm. And we were on our way to the, um, you know, to a place called Spiti Valley in the high Himalayas. And on the way we got uh, stuck because really, really bad weather. There was an extreme kind of weather event and there was like excessive snowfall and rock falls and, you know, landslides. So we were just waiting out the weather. And sort of on the last day, uh, we kind of, before we moved on, we were able to move on. We had this amazing sighting of a snow leopard that had just been, um, that had just killed a blue sheep, which is one of their wild prey species, another 
a fascinating species in its own right. But for now, we'll just talk about it as a as small leopard prey. And uh, you know what what was really special about about that sighting for me was while on the one hand that whole extreme kind of uh, weather event and you know this very clear and present reminder of the damage we've already done to the planet but at this same time you know the fact that an eight-year-old could still you know observe this incredible creature you know of nature you know observe it sitting out there in the wild i think it also kind of filled me with a lot of hope and i, I really think that was one of my most uh, special snow leopards i think that's amazing yeah gosh there, there really can't be many people who have um had such close encounters with snow leopards like yourself and to have spent so much time kind of following them um, I'm going slightly off, off piece, but I want to kind of dig down a little bit more about the species before we kind of turn to your kind of career and other aspects. Um, with regards to snow leopards, I guess two questions are going to bundle together and be a bit cheeky. Like the first one is like, why should people care at all about snow leopards? You know, why are they important? Uh, and you can answer that however you wish, culturally or ecologically, however. Um, and secondly, um, yeah, what is their kind of conservation status like, you know, and, and what might be sort of driving that? I guess what are the threats around it? So why should people care and what are the threats, I think, is really what I'm driving towards and to, to get a clearer picture of the snow leopard. Um, absolutely. I think, um, Nick, the uh, snow leopard, one is it's just, you know, I mean, for people who either have the privilege of being able to see one in the wild or mm -hmm. even for others, it's... It's just just such an incredible for me personally, you know, it is nature at, at its perfection. Mm. You know, this incredible species, you know, just the beauty, the power, the ability to negotiate these, you know, it's almost 70 degree slopes. And, you know, to be able to uh, an animal that has evolved to hunt in those areas. I mean, it's, uh, you know, a reminder of the uh, it's symbol of the essentially the Pleistocene fauna. But it's also such a great symbol for conservation of what is called, but rather unknown, but what is called the third pole. Look, we, we most of us are aware of the North Pole mm -hmm. and the South Pole and the, you know, the imported value and uh, that those regions have, as well as the threats that they face because of increasing warming and climate change. But most of us are not fully aware of the um, of the importance of the third pole and, you know, the, with its uh permanent snow and glaciers you know with its perennial rivers and things like that that region actually um provides fresh water to a third of humanity mm. that region is a representative of this incredible diversity of uh human resilience and human cultures that have evolved to you know live in those landscapes we have evidence of people, you know, for example, on the Tibetan plateau for more, more than maybe 30, 40,000 years. And uh, these were perhaps more initially uh, seasonal seasonal forays to hunt and so on in summer. Mm -hmm. But there is, you know, for thousands of years, there are these cultures and lifestyles that have evolved to uh, survive and thrive in this incredible, you know, uh, harsh environments, very beautiful, but extremely harsh environments. And so there's a lot to lose. I mean, I think just losing a snow leopard to extinction, I think, would leave leave the planet so much poorer. And I think it would be a it, it's not something that we we can sort of um, afford for our future generations. My son would not forgive me if we allowed that to happen. Hmm. But then also, snow leopard is just a, such an incredible and magnetic symbol of the third pole, and uh, you know, and gives us you know a very relatable reason to, to conserve this amazing part of the planet. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you, Sophia. Sorry, you had a, there was another, oh yeah, you, you're, uh, the second part of your question was about their conservation status. And well, they are, um, uh, they face, they're still threatened with extinction. Um, unfortunately, we still don't know how many snow leopards there are in the wild. And I'm hoping for the first time in my 25, 26 years of work, that by the uh, by the middle of next year we'd actually be able to share a figure with you uh, because you know one of the things that we've done is to um, catalyze and support a pretty significant international collaboration effort with a cool acronym it's called PAUSE which stands for Population Assessment of the World Snow Leopards 
So essentially nice. what we've, yeah. So essentially what we've done is first got the governments together because, you know, typically the how many snow leopards we have is a question that we, we, we face from pretty much everybody, but mostly from our governments. And it's really hard to try to explain every time that, that you know, we, we don't actually know. So we got all the 12 governments aligned on this effort. And then and this is a collaboration that our team has been um, supporting amongst close to 50 different organizations. We've done multiple training programs, created, um, how do I say, the uh, standardized and uniform methods of sampling and analysis. We continue to provide, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, support with uh, sampling designs and analytical designs. We have an international science panel that is supporting this work. And for the first time in the history of snow leopard conservation, we will have the first uh, robust estimate of snow leopard population by later, um, uh, by, by the middle of next year. So for now, yes, the conservation status is still, uh, you know, they face extinction in many areas. We've had a uh, reasonable amount of very visible success. Populations have been stable, perhaps even increased, though we don't have necessarily baselines. But there are other large areas where snow leopards face a lot of threats and challenges. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. That's That's so interesting to hear about them. And I think I just have a quick question as well, which is, you know, in building all of these partnerships, all of these alliances across, you know, different stakeholders, governments, everything, how do you get people to agree? Um, what's your top tip for that? Um, a great question, Sophia. I think that uh, one is you need to be committed to doing this because it does require a fair amount of effort and there are frustrations along, along the way, just like there are in conservation. The second thing is I think you really have to know and believe that in conservation, we often celebrate, you know, we tend to celebrate uh, individuals as heroes in conservation and stuff. And I have a pretty good sense of why that has come about. And I think there is a whole uh, nuanced layers of history and not such good history that that, that that is the situation that we are in. But really conservation, effective conservation is done by teams and coalitions. Mm -hmm. And the uh, so you've got to really believe that, you know, genuinely believe that. And then, you know, we've had we've had some experience running these coalitions. And there's a couple of things that uh, I always uh, say are important. One is that um, you, you know, you've got to be ready to work harder than what the effort you expect other people to put in. You You just need to put in much more than what everybody, because if you expect everybody to be, you know, put, put uh, putting in equal amounts of effort, it's, it's it's really, it doesn't work and it's not fair either because people have their programs, their priorities and so on. So you've got to be willing to do the, uh, you know, the, the heavy lifting. You hope that there are a few, few uh, individuals who are as, or who can get as committed as you are and then you know that that really helps with resilience and i think most importantly i think uh, you know you've got to set aside egos and uh not uh, worry about getting credit or uh, claiming credit for 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 the for the efforts because it's really what is really um making a difference is the coalition and not necessarily the effort that goes into building the coalition so I think those few things have really uh, helped us. And these are things we've learned along the way, uh, often the hard way. Yeah, um, I guess um, building off that, so this idea of working as a team and a structure and working with others to kind of create your impact. I mean, your role is executive director at the International Snow Leopard Trust. Um, and <clears throat> what does being an international director mean? Like, how would you describe the job that you do uh, perhaps what skills do you use or what does a typical day or week look like but just bring that job title to life for us if you could please yeah sure nick i guess uh, my um, role is somewhat unusual for the um, for the you know head of uh, any international organization but i say that in a, uh, in a positive way uh, firstly uh, in my case, I actually don't live where the organization is headquartered. It is headquartered in Seattle, but mm -hmm. I continue to live in India. I travel, of course, extensively, but I, uh, we shall not talk about my carbon 
footprint for the moment, but I do travel extensively, but um, I continue to be based in India, but I grew up and where really my conservation journey began. And I am, and I think it has a lot of advantages for uh, the leadership to stay close to the mission. And I'm also in the same time zone, you know, traveling to other countries where we work is much easier. So that is one. Um, secondly, my role involves, you know, it's the incredible privilege of working with some fantastic uh, people and teams. Um, so we have country teams in in several of the snow leopard range countries where, uh, you know, uh, we work together. It's really the country teams and the country directors that are people on the ground. And I used to be a country director once, but, you know, the ability to work with them, the ability to support them both with their research and conservation work. I think that's one of the important uh, uh, roles that I still play. Um, we, we do, like I said, we engage with uh, stakeholder, other stakeholders, the governments, and so on. So once again, you know, we have an amazing team uh, uh, in Bishkek uh, that runs the secretariat, but to be able to work with them and to be able to work with and interact with government representatives, we try to bring environment ministers or their, um, or their designates, including the national focal points, for this program, we try to bring them together once every, uh, at least every one and a half to two years. Mm -hmm. And our last meeting was in um, in Bishkek about a year back, and our next meeting is going to be in um, Samarkand in uh, in February. So you know, uh, part of my work involves that and supporting uh, those uh, those efforts, both in terms of strategy and implementation. And then, um, of course, a really important part of my role is, uh, as is for any other executive director, is to have oversight on administration, you know, compliance, finances, fundraising, and such. Again, a really critical important of the uh, in, critically important part of the job. But then, once again, I have a fantastic team that I work with. And I guess finally, you know, my association with uh, with uh, organizations like the Weekly Fund for Nature and more recently with National Geographic Society, that has led me, uh, you know, that has allowed me to really um, expose me to some amazing conservationists working in different parts of the world. And, uh, and you know, just to have the ability to interact with the, them, to learn from them, as well as to try and do things together. Increasingly, uh, it is my effort to see if we can, how we can create synergies. And, you know, these, these are just amazingly impactful and um, and good people that it would be a lost chance if we did not actually try to work together and create a more global impact. So a lot of my work now, a lot of my time, I also devote to trying to build those alliances. Sounds like you're a real juggler. You can kind of keep lots of different aspects of the role going, yeah, to kind of to keep you, yeah, on track with the, with the mission. Um, just sticking with careers advice, uh, or at least a careers focus for now, if I can, kind of keep my careers hat on. Uh, and I keep kind of putting two questions together. I apologize for that. I'm just trying to be as conscious as I can with time. Um, looking back at your career and your career to date, like what have been the kind of key moments? That you now realize actually were really important to you whether it's education or jobs or however you want to answer that and then also what advice would you give someone who's potentially thinking about going into conservation or perhaps following in your footsteps so you know what's been your career journey it's been important to you and what advice might you give people who are looking to do to follow in a similar journey uh, nick for me i think um more than i think a career more uh, more than moments i think these have been you know sort of phases and growth phases in my life and I think it started when I you know I was just had such a great privilege to be born in a into a family where my mother have, had a huge amount of compassion for towards plants and animals you know in terms of our gardens and pets and all our rescue animals and so on and I, so I think that did impact me at a relatively uh, young age and it also helped that my uh, both my parents were kind of in 
academics and they kind of supported my education and you know allowed me to follow my passion and that is important i don't take that lightly because um uh, you know when we were growing up at that point in time in india there's not too many opportunities around and for many of the people that uh, grew up with me i think that you know they did not have the I'm a remarkable people, of course, but they did not have the kind of support to pursue their dream, pursue the kind of, mm-hmm. you know, higher education that I was able to pursue and so on. So I think that was, again, really, really helped me to sort of, uh, you know, be able to make progress in terms of my career growth. Um, my PhD, I think my uh, PhD years were transformational for me, really. And, you know, the um, for three different reasons. One is I really, I think it was my PhD that I learned to actually do and enjoy, even enjoy science. So that yeah. was nice. And I still, I, I, that helps me a lot still because, you know, conservation can, it, it, it has its ups and downs and can be very frustrating and so on and so forth. And, you know, just to be able to pursue science is kind of, you know, it's a creative pursuit and it's uh, mo- mostly um, nice and rewarding personally. The other thing that happened, uh, well, coincidentally, it wasn't really related. Just before I started on my PhD program, I had um, uh, I kind of we had gotten together a small bunch of us, and I had co-founded the Nature Conservation Foundation. Yeah, mm. and that was, and subsequently, post PhD, I actually uh, you know ran the foundation as its executive director for many years, and that was really uh, again very helpful for me because. It taught me a lot in terms of, you know, what makes uh, an organization work or doesn't. And, you know, the especially the value of understanding, because we, we had to do, you know, you're, a, you're an entrepreneur yourself, Nick. So, you know, you would understand this. We had to do pretty much everything ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. You know, from, you know, the, finding an office when we finally got a little bit of money, you know, buying the furniture and running to the post office. This is, and this was pre-internet days and, you know, going and queuing up for all the government permits and, you know, um, accounts, everything. Mm -hmm. So that gave me a pretty good sense of not just how an organization, what it takes to run an organization, but like I said, you know, understanding the value of every little uh, piece of, what go of that machinery and you know how ev- you know everyone needs to be functioning optimally and um to, for it to be a, a impactful organization mm. and i think the most impact uh, the most impactful and transformational uh, uh part for me during that phase was i lived with a high mountain community in the Himalayas for four years. You know, I was uh, nearly four years. I was doing my, I was there essentially as a researcher and I was there to collect my data. Mm. But then when I started living there and I think I I really started learning the, my first lessons in, in conservation. And until then I had kind of been trained in implicitly or explicitly in fortress conservation and how communities were the real cause of all problems and so on. And that that's the that that's the kind of um, mindset I had gone to those high mountains with. And that that, you know, those four years were just so transformational for me. I mean, that's I learned so much there. And then, you know, I amongst other things, I also learned the, you know, the um, how do you say I picked up some empathy along the way and you know and the beauty of grace of people the beauty of grace of humanity you know living in you know and the human spirit despite living in such you know for me what what seemed like a really really difficult and conditions and people facing extreme hardships and so on and yet that they could be so graceful and you know and be part of such rich cultures and I think that was uh, both very humbling and um, taught me a lot and had probably on the most transformational impacts on me um, during that uh, that uh, four or five year period. Mm, really interesting yeah and just to I'm going to pass back you to you Sophia in a second my final question was around careers advice if there's someone listening and they would love to either follow a similar career path or just work in conservation more generally what advice might you give them? Look, one uh, simple 
think if somebody is interested in conservation, it's very clear that they are following their passion. And, I, and I, there's already, you know, uh, um, hats off to them. And, you know, I salute such people who are in, maybe in any field, but really, you know, are willing to take risks and follow their passion and step out of their comfort, comfort zone. I think that is, that is, you know, kind of half the, uh, half the journey already there. Um, like I said earlier, we, you know, we celebrate, you know, we, and I don't think that's, okay, it may have some value, but I think we excessively celebrate individuals. Conservation is about building teams and coalitions. And I think that, you know, engaging with people who actually, you know, engaging with each other, of course, and conservation is very good to, at talking to each other. And I, that's important, of course, but we do not spend enough time talking to people outside of the, our immediate spheres. And I think that, uh, you know, whether it's corporations or governments and others, you know, and, and in fact, we often tend to have a lot of discomfort engaging with, uh, you know, people from outside the community or even sometimes look at them in disdain and, you know, view them as the cause of all the conservation problems and so on. And I think that, you know, stepping out of our comfort zones and you know trying to relate to people i'm not saying i'm, I'm great at it but at least you know uh, attempting to relate you know engage with and relate to people who are outside of our community who may have other priorities and you know both in their professions and in their lives and those priorities may not always align with ours and they might even conflict with ours but those are the in some sense the most important people to engage with and therefore the value of outreach and building alliances. And my only other thing would be to, which I feel very strongly about is to try and be, um, again, I don't think I have enough of it, so it's easier to preach, but to try and be more uh, thoughtful and empathetic in the way, in our actions and the way we approach and do conservation. Because what we do um, impacts Definitely and hopefully positively, what we do impacts nature and biodiversity positively, but what we do also often impacts people. And often it impacts people who are at the margins already, people who are, uh, you know, already the weaker sections of our society, they often suffer and they have historically suffered because of actions of conservationists. And I think that one of the, my personal, um, appeal to anybody interested in conservation to is to really become more thoughtful to think about the consequences of their actions and to actually see if we can start viewing those people that we have actually typically looked at uh, as the problems for conservation and typically who have been victims of conservation to see if they can actually we can partner with them for them to become conservation leaders and become beneficiaries of conservation. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. I mean, just in listening you, to you talk about all of these experiences, you know, during your PhD and and maybe coming in with this more sort of fortress conservation mentality, um, and these ideas are these. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, uh, yeah, like notions of conservation that are now changing. Um, I think people who don't work in conservation day to day don't always see some of the ethical. Um, issues that can happen within it right um, and just as you were talking about these you know people being impacted by it and, and all of this even as wildlife is being saved um, you've recently launched the ethical conservation alliance um, and which plays into so many of these ideas um, do you think you can tell us a little bit about it um, why it's needed and if you have an idea yet what your kind of ideas of ethical conservation do look like um, if even if we have examples of what unethical conservation might look like, um, yeah, that's a, a complex and a nuanced question, uh, Sophia. I'll try try my best. Um, I think that the uh, yeah, firstly, I think this uh, the ethical conservation alliance that we've launched uh, recently. Um, it's been a collective effort. It's been something that we have launched collectively. I'm very excited about it. Um, to start with, our really mission is to promote or create a sort of worldwide movement towards ethical conservation. And the way the people involved right now and the people who will get involved with this professional alliance 
And the way we think we can do this best is by really supporting uh, conservationists around the world uh, through a few different means, but largely through training and capacity building in terms of how to engage ethically and effectively with local and indigenous communities of conservation. And even from a, you know, apart from the fact that we believe it's the right thing to do to, to really uh, engage and, um, and, you know, create or support local and indigenous communities to become uh, leaders in conservation. I think apart from it being the right thing to do, it's, it's also perhaps a very practical thing to do considering that we have, you know, global goals of protecting 30% of the planet and so on. How are we going to do that? Is it going to be once again requiring um, a huge amount of uh, injustices and um, and eviction of local and indigenous communities? And unfortunately, that's happening already. You know, look at various parts of the world, and already, you know, in pursuit either of our commercial interests or our national or glo or global goals, we are continuing to then further strengthen and perpetuate the kind of unjust conservation practices that, that have really punctuated the whole history of conservation so far. So trainings and creating global awareness, and that is not just amongst conservationists. Like, you know, Sophia, you rightly said that, you know, when you, in general, conservation is considered to be a noble thing, and you know, an ethical thing. And it is in some ways a noble thing to do, you know, you're giving a voice to the voiceless plants and animals. But at the same time, we need to, it's very nuanced, but we need to make the, you know, the citizens across the world more aware of the kind of history of unjust conservation efforts and how we need to, you know, become uh, more or follow more ethical practices when we are uh, promoting um, nature conservation and we're talking about protecting 30% of the planet. So that's the... Uh, a very important thing that we uh, hope to do together. This this uh, this group already that has come together. It has conservation leaders from uh, grassroots conservation leaders from 29 different countries. Incredible experience. 500 years of collective experience. All of the all of us or most of us anyway have been you know grappling with these issues of you know um, we've not been you know it's troubled us a lot you know and uh, in our kind of uh, as our thoughts, uh, individual thinking has evolved, it has troubled us the kind of the history of conservation and the kind of conservation efforts that still yeah, get uh, you know uh, get promoted, and we want to change that. And what better way to change it than you know people at the forefront of grassroots conservation efforts who actually believe in an ethical approach to conservation? So that is the story of the Ethical Conservation Alliance. It's just been launched, as as you said, Sophia, last week, or uh, yeah, a week, uh, ten days back in London. And there's a long way to go, but we've we have made some progress uh, in the run up to the launch. We've, uh, you know, our uh, amazing members have um, done some orientation or actually full fledged training programs already. In, six countries in various parts of the world then you know we've had um, more than 130 140 uh, conservationists who've got trained um, of course one training is not, not enough but it's a start they've got mm -hmm. trained in how to engage ethically and effectively with communities and stuff long way to go but it's it's a start that's wonderful it's so impressive like what yeah really really looking forward to see what you all come up with and and I mean I think throughout this conversation it's just been so apparent how much you do um and how how many different things you're constantly working on I I do know that you sometimes you're a long distance runner and sometimes you hold your meetings while you're running alongside <laughs> some of the people that you're talking to um and so yeah you just have this amazing energy um with my optimism hat on what keeps you optimistic about the future of nature? Yeah, I, I mean, if I have to be very brutally honest, um, Sophia, I, I don't know if I am very optimistic. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, just, just given the 
you know, all indications, you know, that you see around, uh, around, we see around ourselves, you know, in the middle of a mass extinction of species, you know, uh, most of the planet has been degraded, uh, you know, the lands and oceans, you know, overfishing our oceans, the lands are degraded. And the unfortunate part is that, you know, post pandemic, we, you know, one would have hoped that the pandemic was an important uh, kind of a, uh, lesson for kind of humanity to collectively reboot and really uh, introspect on the kind uh, on why we are where we are and uh, it's a way clearly we are where we are because of the very very unsustainable model of economic development that we have chosen since the industrial revolution right but you know post pandemic we've pretty much gone back to our you know the usual economies of scale and things like mm -hmm. that so even something that is as catastrophic and you know, as tragic as, as a global pandemic with incredible loss of lives and so on. And even if that is not able to shake humanity out of its, you know, complacence in terms of what we are doing to nature and biodiversity, it's hard to be optimistic and add to that, you know, what's going on in the world, you know, where the geopolitical conflicts and, you know, terrorist attacks and genocide and so on. I mean, there's not a political forum, but all these things also impinge on conservation. And therefore, you know, it's it's difficult to be optimistic. But you know, I am. You know, I'm not. I'm not hopeless. You know, I I do have a lot of hope, and I think that I strongly believe that as conservationists, our actions are important. Um, one of my, uh, uh, you know, Nick had asked me earlier about uh, giving advice to somebody who's thinking about a conservation um, career, and one of my advice would be to, you know please don't think of any action that you want to take as being small. Please be thoughtful about it. Please understand that it will have consequences. It will have impacts, mostly positive, but let's also make sure that we, we reduce our negative impacts. But I think that one of the things I strongly believe in is no step is too small. So yes, please go out and take that action. And coming back to uh, your uh, point, Sophia, so, uh, you know, I, I am very, very hopeful that our actions are important and our actions are important in being able to even if they are able to slightly tip the balance and it's 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 really hard you know that economic development model and against that you know on the other side you have you know biodiversity and nature conservation it's really really hard but if we can tip that balance even a little bit i think in favor of conservation i think that is going to be very very significant and, and i think that's what keeps me going oh. Well, thank you for giving such a thoughtful answer to the question. I think that you're right. Conservation is is always a balance, right? Um, I know that I will go up and down on my roller coaster sometimes. Um, in terms of you know how hopeful I'm feeling on a particular day or or about a particular project and all of that. And and um, yeah, thank you for giving such a thoughtful answer. Mm. No, and being so honest as well. I think yeah, that's really important. Yeah. Um, well, we're actually bang on schedule and bang on time. So um, what we'd like to do at this point is just open up to our audience. We've had a bunch of people listening. Welcome. Thank you for sitting there um, on silence on mute. Um, feel free to now um, unmute yourselves if you wish, or at least show us your videos. You're very welcome to do so. You don't have to. That's up to you. Just bear in mind, we are recording this. We are planning to share it as well. So just be be, be aware of that. But we'd love you to kind of join in the conversation. If you've got any questions um, for Charu, um, you've been listening to his career and his advice. Is there anything you'd like to ask of him specifically? Maybe the easiest way to do so is if you sort of raise your hand, you should find a kind of raise hand button. Okay, and then we can kind of hand over to you and you can ask your question. So, uh, Magana, I can see you've already raised your hand. So I'm going to I'm going to pass over to you to start with. As um, others, you know, feel free to also raise your hand and I'll make sure we kind of you know give you a chance within the next 15 minutes. That's how long we've got. So, yeah, uh, Magana, if you want to uh, unmute and ask your question, you feel free to do so, please. Hi. Hi, Dr. Charu. Thank you so much for um, talking to us today. It was really interesting. Um, my name is Megana. I'm a undergraduate student and I'm looking to kind of pursue a career approaching conservation through policy and I really want to work with environmental policy. So I was kind of wondering what insights you had regarding that. I know you said you um, work with governments a lot and like what kinds of things um, you find are most effective in getting governments to uh, uh, greedy or work with you on conservation? 
Great question, Meghna. Firstly, I think I would thank you and I would like to congratulate you on taking up uh, and you know, wanting to pursue as a career option you know, something about conservation policy, which is not really the, you know, the sexiest part of uh, conservation, if I may, and but critically, critically important. And so um, what... Well, you know, what, what we have found effective uh, working with governments, and at some point I can put you in touch with my incredible team members who, um, if you're interested, who actually uh, play a very, very significant role in building those relationships and maintaining those relationships with governments. But what we have found very useful is uh, a few different things. One is that, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tightrope, right? It's a diploma, you know, it's a tightrope in diplomacy. You need to be able to oppose governments uh, when the policies and decisions are against what you believe are in the interest of biodiversity, nature conservation, or the people who can get affected. Uh, but at the same time, you need to work with them. So I think that, you know, I mean, some of us kind of, you know, learned uh, diplomacy the hard way through trial and error and so on. But I, I think that, you know, paying a lot of attention to to um, to that, you know, treading that tight tightrope is really helpful. Secondly, what we have found is it doesn't help to just, you know, uh, always important as it is, you know, uh, and that sometimes you'd really have to go public and raise your voice because otherwise nothing else works. But often it helps to, you know, actually be able to have a more constructive dialogue with policymakers, whether you know, especially with politicians, but also with the implementers, with the policymakers in terms of you know the, the civil services, because there are a lot of smart people there. And they are willing, you know, if and if we are willing to, you know, if we are willing to step out of our comfort zones and meet with them and engage with them, you know, there are frustrating times, but but there is there is a lot of hope there. Thirdly, I think there is a lot in common that we have in terms of what we are trying to achieve and in what they are trying to achieve. You know, so with, with many, with most of our governments, for example, you know, they've ratified the uh, various conventions, the CBD and others, and the governments themselves are hard pressed to kind of uh, both uh, figure out strategically what actions to implement under those international conventions. Mm -hmm as well as then be able to actually, uh, you know, um, measure it and to be able to show it and so on. And those are areas that we can actually support them and, you know, work with them. And um, and we've also supported governments with actually a drafting of policies and such. So essentially, once again, it is something then that you do on behalf of governments. You don't necessarily, you know, want to take credit for what you do and so on. But so these are some of the things that we have kind of in our experience that we have learned. I'm sure I'm missing a few important ones, Megana, but maybe a follow-up conversation mm -hmm. for you with one of our team members might, might be helpful. Thank you. That's great. Oh, thank you so much. That's great, thank you. Um, I can see there's a couple of questions in comments in chat and I'll, I'll address them in a second as well. Um, any more comments from those? Um, also that kind of on the call. Welcome to Kate. I can see Kate there from the Whitley Fund for Nature as well. Great supporter of your work, Chara. Good to have you on the call. Yeah, Kate, you want to say a few words, ask a question? Yeah, um, I just have a quick question actually for Chari. I was um, fortunate. Oh, hi Toshi as well. Lovely to see you. <laughs> um, no, I was fortunate enough to be there at the People for Planet Summit when the Alliance was announced and um, obviously have a, a little bit of insight from that. But one question that I um, have pondered um, in seeing some of the, the beginning of this take shape is, are there any, or rather what are the um, the shared challenges that you're finding across different countries? Because obviously you're saying the key to the um, alliance is that it's global and there's obviously people from 28 different countries. And yeah, are there any obvious, obvious or key things that you're seeing from country to country that are the challenges of working with communities? Um, just to kind of help all of us sort of get a sense of, of what it is that you're addressing. Can I append a question on as I keep doing as well, because that relates very quite closely to Flavia's question in the comments too, Kate, which is how do you work um, across different cultures and societies as well? So 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, great questions. Maybe Flavia's part first. I think uh, Flavia that I personally I strongly believe that um, that you know. Um, you know, it's possible to relate to, you know, it doesn't matter what culture um, uh, or country you're talking about. Like I grew up in India in a pretty, pretty multicultural environment in many of the places that I have worked in, many people that I've interacted with, um, not just in India, but, you know, in other parts of Asia, you know, we don't even have a common language. Mm. And yet there are, there are things that... Um, that everybody, uh, you know, uh, that everyone shares, right? And um, having, it's always helpful to have this fundamental belief or assumption that, you know, the majority of people, wherever they are, whichever culture, whichever society, majority of people that you will interact with are fundamentally decent and fundamentally smart. And I think that's a starting point. And and there are values that we share. I, I think that there are values that we share as humanity and which is, you know, kind of, to me, I like to believe that it is culture agnostic. I mean, I'm not a very, you know, okay, I understand um, moral relativism to a certain extent, but I only to some extent. And I do believe that, you know, there are some um, ethical values and other values that we are able to pretty much share across humanity. And I think those things make it easier to work across cultures and um, countries. Um, at the beginning, uh, Sophia talked about your partner's principles, which is sort of a you know a book I had written in 2016, which is essentially um, uh, uh, kind of eight principles that for conservation is in terms of how to engage ethically and effectively with local and indigenous communities. Again, not, not that, you know, um, it's not perfect and it's not written in stone. But uh, what we have found is that Partners Principles was kind of developed into a training program uh, thanks to some amazing colleagues and partners that I was fortunate to work with, I, I still am. And that training actually has been, people have found it extremely useful irrespective of the cultures, ecosystems, countries that we've been working in. We've had people working in fisheries, we have people working with elephants, you know, lions, uh, snow leopards, hornbills, it doesn't matter. So I think that there is, um, there, is, uh, um, there is a great scope for being able to be, to work effectively and build alliances, conservation alliances across countries and cultures. Of course, one has to be, uh, you know, respectful towards the cultural differences and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charu. Coming yeah. to Kate's, um, uh, sure, sorry. Please, I was just going to say, did um, you answer Kate's question? I think you were about to do that, so please. Thank you. Yeah, coming to Kate's question, Kate, I think that the, it's it's not, I, I don't think I would want to single out one country or the other, but I, I think it is pretty much uniform. You know, look at the, if we were to look deeply at the history and even the present practices in conservation, you know, just just scratch the surface and, you know, across across countries, you find that, you know, either there are, you know, history has been, definitely history has been very top down and unjust, but even today, right, the, the conservation efforts are very top down and rather unjust, and this is across countries. You know, one good example, for example, is 167,000 Maasai who have, uh, you know, appealed to many countries and international organizations, even today, uh, that they face eviction. And sadly, they face eviction. And ironically, they face eviction from some of the lands that they had been evicted to, or when they had been evicted to create Serengeti National Park in 1940, and the lands they moved to, now they are being evicted from those lands as well, right? And this is, and, but this is not to single out, you know, one group or, or one community. It happens, it's happening in my country. It is happening in pretty much every country. Our, uh, we are as a society and our governments are actually able, are willing to make way and compromise conservation um, efforts and conservation outputs in the interest of economic development. You know, when there is pressure from corporations and, you know, when there is pressure from powerful entities, 
we we routinely compromise conservation efforts. Uh, we even you know loosen or denotify protected areas, and that is happening even today. But on the other hand, you know when it comes to really the weakest sections of our society, we we believe that we somehow have the right that we can impose conservation on them rather than you know really being able to see how they can actually be integrated into the movement and brought into the into leadership uh, roles in conservation movement. So I think it's a problem that we uh, that is it, it's a global issue. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, probably got time for one more question. I can see Tulshi, you've got your hand up, so I'm going to pass over to you. Um, what would you like to ask of Cheru? Oh, you're on mute, Tulshi. Sorry, you need to click on mute. Yeah. No, you're sorry. You're still on mute, Tulshi. If you can hear us, can you can you find the unmute button? Sorry. Hello, everyone. I'm Tulsi Lashmi Swal from Nepal. I'm also the WFN awardee for 2023. And, and it is my great pleasure to hear Dr. Charu because I'm also working in conservation for last 15 years. But when we hear the story of Dr. Charu, he is working incredible work for over 25 years, I think 26 years. So he is one of the inspiration for all of us conservationists. And we are very much connected because he is working in a snow leopard, king of Himalayas, which I belongs to Nepal, right? So that is the country of Himalayas. So I have two questions, already one question asked by the Kate. And I have now only one question, very simple question. Everybody asks with me in our country when I travel in abroad, what is the key that keeps you over a two decades in the conservations? Mm -hmm. Dr. Zan, simple. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, Tulsi. Um, great to great to see you, and thank you uh, for your kind words. Congratulations on your award. And um, um, I should tell you that you and I, I have some Nepal connections myself. Mero ama Nepali, oh, and I have still family in Nepal, and yes. it's uh, very dear to me, your country, and uh, <laughs> and you know, look, I uh, firstly I would just you know like to state once again that you know the yeah yes absolutely it's been I feel it's been an incredible privilege to be have been being able to be in conservation uh, for the last uh, twenty five years, and I. Um, hope and would pray and hope that I have a few more years to go. And it's just, I, I still, every day, I feel privileged to, uh, you know, to be doing what I'm able to do, frustrating as we can, it can be, as you you know very well. And I think that the, uh, the other thing is I've been really privileged to be able to work with very fantastic teams and uh, also, you know, interact with very inspiring people, you know, like you and others. So that also keeps me uh, going. The community members that had transformational impact on the way I view things, the way I view communities and so on, you know, I, you know, they, they give me a lot of hope and inspiration. And so, yeah, it's a whole bunch of things. And I, you know, occasionally, I've been very, very fortunate that my, work and career and the work of our teams has occasionally been punctuated with these, uh, you know, um, incredible uh, national and global recognition, the Whitley Awards and a few others. And, you know, some of those things, sometimes they are a bit unfair because they single you out because, but, you know, the, whereas the work is kind of, you know, really uh, what you do as teams and coalitions. But at the same time, they're very enabling, you know, they have been, you know, my Whitley Awards, you know, uh, uh, has have been very enabling uh, when I started to, first in 2005, when I really wanted to, you know, um, scale the program up and we wanted to work with the government of India on policy, start an education program for kids in rural, in the Himalayan uh, states and things like that. So, you know, th there have been some very enabling and encouraging moments and, you know, I have... I think I've received more than my fair share of recognition along the way. And I guess that's helped as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Yeah, well, we're, oh, yeah. we're up thank on you. time. Yeah, and thank you so much, Tulshi. Yeah, thanks for your time <laughs> and your questions. Um, 
Sophia, this has been a lot of fun, hasn't it? But we're up on time, so we start wrapping yeah. things up. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much to everyone who attended. Thank you to Nick for, you know, co-hosting this. Um, and also to Charu for mm. giving us his time and answering all of these questions. Um, and to all of you for being here. So thank you. That's great. Thank you very yeah, much. I want to say also thank you to Kate as well. You, you, without yeah. you, we wouldn't have yeah. organized yeah. this. So thank you to the Whitley Fund for, for Nature too. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And my final question to Chariot as we call off, uh, if people want to find out more about your work, maybe support or get involved, where should we send them? Um, I would recommend at this point two websites, uh, snowleopard.org, easy to remember, and ethicalconservation.net. Again, easy to remember, but by next week, it should be ethicalconservation.org as well. So thank you. Thanks. Well, yeah, thanks for me. And thank you also, Sophie. You've been a great co-host. I've really enjoyed this event with you and Conservation Optimism. Thank you for coming, everyone. Take care all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop my recording at this end as well. So, yeah.